Now, Professor Syed Mohammed Morandi is Chair of American Studies at the University of Tehran. He's one of our most learned and most popular guests, and I'm glad to welcome him back to the mother of all talk shows uh, this Thank evening. You. These are very grim times, Professor. Uh, I don't know if you heard my uh, opening uh, comments, uh, but if you uh, did, kindly uh, opine uh, on them. And let me know, if you didn't, that uh, what you think is now going to happen. Can Netanyahu really be allowed to resume mass slaughter in the next few hours? Well, he wants to continue with the slaughter, and so does his government. And from the polls that we've been seeing, overwhelmingly, Israelis want to see mass slaughter. But I think the Americans are very worried. They understand that their interests are at stake here. The axis of resistance that you were alluding to, as you rightly said, is a real thing. We saw not only Hezbollah and Lebanon defend the Gazans through the battles alongside the border and forcing a huge portion of the Israeli army to go to the north. But we also saw how Ansarullah in Yemen uh, fired drones and missiles and also took uh, three or took and damaged three ships of the Israeli regime. But also very important is the fact that the Iraqi resistance, they've been harassing American bases in Iraq and the bases in Syria, which of course are illegal. And I think that all of these combined uh, is very threatening to the United States. I think in, in Syria and Iraq in particular, these bases are small and far apart and they're very vulnerable. The Americans are actually being very foolish by putting these troops in these areas, which uh, can easily be, easily be targeted and uh, be overrun if there's a serious battle. So the risks are very high. And I think this is a sign in itself that the Israeli regime, which used to be once upon a time considered as an asset of the United States, it is really a burden now. It is detrimental to the interests of the United States and the Europeans. It has caught it it costs the United States uh, a great deal, not financially only, but the United States and the Europeans have destroyed their credibility over the last couple of months across the world. People across the global south are looking to the United States, looking to Europe and seeing that they are a part of this genocide. This is something unprecedented in human history, where we see a, geno a genocide taking place in front of a global audience. And simultaneously, as we've, we're watching this for the first time live, we see Western governments say, the war must go on. We can't have a ceasefire. I was, in, I was invited to China a few weeks ago. The Chinese were outraged. They are today outraged. In fact, just a couple of days ago, uh, I spoke to a, a key uh, academic, an influential academic, and he said, not only are, China, are the Chinese outraged by what they're seeing on the screen, but no Chinese business in future is going to invest in Israel. Israel is not seen as a stable and uh, a, a country that is strong and independent and a place where someone is going could, could invest in. So they've lost China. I've been to Russia again as well. Uh, at, I was invited by two universities. The mood is anti-Israeli. So this is something that we're seeing literally across the global south, India side. The Israeli regime is not only di being diminished itself, but it is diminishing Europe and the United States in the eyes of the world. And so the Americans recognize this. They recognize that in their conflict with China, in their conflict with Russia, 
they are losing global public opinion. They are the brand America is wrecked and destroyed. So any further war is just going to hurt the Americans more. It's not that the Americans and the Europeans are against genocide. No, we've seen them support it. The issue is not that they care about human rights. They don't. But they are afraid that this is going to benefit the rivals when their rivals are seen as behaving in a humane manner and seeking justice, whereas they are supporting supremacism, racism, exceptionalism, and brutality, genocide, and another Holocaust. You're a professor of American studies, of course. How do you account for, I mean, I suppose you might say, well, look at Germany, they've committed suicide. But how, how do you account for the absolutely ironclad consensus which exists across the political class, all the way to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, in support of a land far away of 7 million people, a considerable proportion of them Americans, by the way, uh, why would you destroy your global capital, political, cultural, social capital, for someone like Netanyahu? I think there are a host of reasons. One is, of course, uh, the Epstein effect. And I'm very, I'm absolutely certain that there are more Epsteins out there than we think, and that they have a lot of dirt on a lot of people. I think that's one issue. Another issue is sheer arrogance. This empire, the Western empire, the American empire, together it's been around for centuries. This Eurocentric worldview is deeply embedded in among the elites across Europe and especially the United States. The United Washington is a bubble. The neocons and many others continue to think that the United States is the indispensable nation. That's what Biden just said in his recent op-ed, if he had anything to do with the text itself. I have no idea. <laughs> but we know that that term came from Madeleine Albright, the same woman who said 500,000 dead Iraqis due to sanctions was worth it. Uh, you know, they, she said that the Americans stand taller and look far further than other nations. That's exceptionalism. And that exceptionalism is very similar to Zionism. Zionism is also exceptionalism. It's a chosen people. They're above and beyond, uh, above the rest of us. And so there is a sim similarity, you know, city on the hill, the United, the, the Puritans and so on, manifest destiny. There's, there's striking similarities between the United States and the Israeli regime. So there's this arrogance too, but also there's Zionism. And I, I personally believe that it's not really, uh, I think it's Christian Zionism that is more influential, more dangerous, and more powerful than its uh, so-called Jewish counterpart. The uh, obvious next question then, uh, although I know the answer, I'd, I'd be interested in yours. Uh, that's the reason for the United States stand. What's the reason for the almost, with the exception of Belgium and Spain, uh, almost a complete phalanx of European governmental, and not just governmental, you know, um, if you put up a Palestine flag at Glasgow Celtic Football Club, the European football authorities will fine you scores of thousands of pounds when they were well, handing out Ukrainian flags at the football games just a few months ago. Uh, it's, it's not just the government, it's the civic society is so completely behind Netanyahu. Why? A part of it is really the same. This Eurocentric world that we've seen for centuries still thrives in the corridors of power in London and Paris and and Berlin. Uh, this this arrogance and and racism that uh, that that exists among these elites. But uh, I think there's also a strong element of subordination to the United States. 
they destroyed you you alluded to this they destroyed themselves during the ukraine war they sacrificed europe for the americans the german economy has been destroyed the green party led the 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 the, the battle to destroy germany for the sake of the united states so europe is not has no role to play in the world that we live in anymore it is simply a sidekick for the Americans. In Iran, we discovered this during the negotiations. The, the Europeans really don't have any, they don't carry any weight at the negotiating table. And now as they are destroying their economy uh, because of Ukraine and because of the cutting off relations with Russia and the absence of Russian gas, it's going to simply get worse. So again, it's it's a, it's a combination of arrogance it's a combination of a sense of Eurocentric exceptionalism and racism among these elites. You were deeply involved in the anti-war movement in 2003. You know this better than perhaps anyone else, that everyone in the UK almost literally was against the war. But the BBC, even the Guardian, all the media outlets, even the, the so-called uh, loyal opposition, the, the 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 leftist media, literally everyone was pro-war, and those who stood against the war uh, in the media, as soon as the war began, they began to support the boys. So it is a hopeless cause for anyone to to uh, have any hope in the current political establishment, whether in the United States or in London or in the UK or anywhere else across Europe. The only hope is for a greater awareness. And we are seeing that take place. We are seeing this awakening take place across the global south. People are seeing these outrageous imminent images and 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 you see huge numbers going to the streets in the West. And one point that I think is very important, and that is that actually the ceasefire is a big mistake if the Israeli regime wants to continue with the war again. Because the outrage that we've been experiencing for weeks has angered people, and this is something you alluded to at the beginning of the show, has angered people across the world. But now we've had a few days of relative quiet. Of course, we saw outrageous scenes just from the West Bank today when they killed two children, when they murdered them. But the relative quiet now, if this is if this ends and we see the beginning of a second wave, a second genocide, I think that the anger that that will create across the world, the world will be much more intense than that of the first wave. Professor Morandi, always a pleasure and a great experience to hear your wisdom. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all Thank talk you. shows.